for help. Um, but there's actually a door for help, which they can enter or they can go through at the time that they're ready. So what we're hoping to do here is create a similar cultural shift with human trafficking, which at present is one of the largest industries in the entire world. Um, some studies suggest that over 30% of our undocumented population in this country is actually not just been exploited, but also the victim of trafficking, which is roughly 3 million people. In my, in my humble opinion, that's no small number, and I still think that's an underreported number. Um, to be completely honest, in my political views, <laughs> I think that our immigration system is intentionally designed this way so that we always have a vulnerable class of workers, which can be exploited um, for our markets. So I appreciate all of you giving your time today to learn more about this topic and perhaps in the capacity in which you interact with immigrant populations, particularly something here might be useful to you as a red flag uh, for someone who could use more services that actually do exist by law that are, that are terribly underutilized only because we're not really identifying this problem as ubiquitously as it's occurring in our populations, in our communities, in our own backyards. Um, that's kind of my spiel on human trafficking. <laughs> um, and I, again, thank you so much for your time this evening and learning more about this and uh, we can just get started. If there's any questions that come up during the presentation, it is divided into three parts. So I would ask that you just save your questions for the end of each part. There's some small interactive exercises that I hope will help cement some of the concepts that we're gonna go over today, but this is just a really quick down and dirty of like how, how this crime is actually occurring in the modern era. Almost every case, every case example I'm using here is actually a case I worked on um, that was positively identified as a human trafficking case. And hopefully this will just give you a bigger idea of how broad the legal definition is and how often we can actually, we're missing opportunities to actually help people get services that they deserve. Before we start, does anyone have any questions? Okay. Um, can you all see my PowerPoint? Yeah? Okay. Give me one second. Two years into the pandemic, and I still struggle a little bit to utilize them. Okay. Um, so the whole topic of this is that labor rights are immigrant rights. And even though that this is the topic, we're mostly going to be focusing on human trafficking, but we'll just go over it step by step. Um, so, oh, sorry. So the Venn diagram between immigration and labor is actually very significant. As we all know, immigrants tend to come here for better opportunity. And even when an immigrant may not meet the legal definition for trafficking, I've never met an immigrant, including my own parents, who have not been exploited or harassed or abused in some way, shape, or form in the workplace just because they don't know their rights. And so, and my parents are both English speaking, my dad's a professional, and they still encountered these problems. So you can only imagine that when the vulnerability factors pick up, that there's even more abuse occurring. And so, here at Dolores Street, almost every single client we've encountered has experienced some type of workplace problem, whether that's discrimination, harassment, abuse, exploitation, and on the extreme end, human trafficking. Um, this impacts almost all immigrants, including technical labor, like H-1B holders who often work in the tech industries, um, but more so undocumented immigrants because they occupy a particularly vulnerable and precarious place in our society due to their lack of status. Um, this topic is timely. It's been timely. I think the rise of labor exploitation and trafficking has occurred as gradually as most other discrepancies in our um, in income inequality have increased over the last 20, 30 years. But things to note in terms of this last administration and how bad it got was that from 2015 to 2017, within California, the number of workplace threats that were actually reported related to immigration related retaliation. That is somebody telling you that if you do this, I'm going to call immigration on you. Or if you if you try to complain, we're going to report you to immigration. That went up to 94 complaints by the end of 2017. So that's just to note that the end of Trump's first year of presidency, there was such a significant uptick from the year before, uh, which is not surprising at all. I think racist employers became 
emboldened to use this threat against immigrants. And then with COVID hitting, it became even worse. Um, we know that domestic violence and human trafficking has actually gone up globally. And what, I mean, what else do people really expect when there's less jobs and a bad economy? There's just more desperation. So there's more opportunity for those who want to exploit to exploit others. Um, the main thing that I hope you take away from this presentation today is that all immigrants have labor rights, regardless of their status, which is something that most people don't realize. Um, and because most of these rights are violated because people don't realize that. But no matter who you are, whether you have status or not, you're still entitled to basic labor rights in this country, which include wage and hour protection. Um, like you should be getting paid the minimum wage, you should be getting overtime, and you should be getting breaks. The whole gamut of things that exist for us as people with status also exists for people without status, but routinely this is violated and we all know that. Today, what I hope you learn is a bit about wage and hour laws, but not necessarily like, oh, in San Francisco, it's 15.26 an hour, and in Oakland, it's 12.23 an hour. I, not like that. Just generally, what are common workplace crimes that occur? Um, but more so than that, what we're going to do is clarify and learn about human trafficking. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions that occur around exploitation versus human trafficking, like labor exploitation versus human trafficking, uh, domestic violence versus human trafficking, what extortion is instead of human trafficking, and smuggling and human trafficking. So I hope that you have a little bit more clarity as to how these how these crimes often overlap significantly, but there is a very clear line as to what makes one human trafficking and what doesn't. Um, I hope today by the end of this presentation, you will understand the more subtle ways in which traffickers use force defraud and intimidate and trap survivors into performing work and services. And finally, I hope you somewhat develop the skills to talk and educate other community members in a trauma-informed sensitive way about the things you're learning today. Throughout the presentation, I will be referring to survivors of human trafficking as survivors. Uh, we like to use this language because it tends to be a little bit more empowering than calling someone a victim. Um, yeah. That's just the short of it. <laughs> um, here's our agenda for today. We're just going to go over some basic workplace rights and then dive right into what human trafficking is with some case examples. And then the last part will be a little bit about how you can talk to individuals you may be encountering in a way that may actually help them or be supportive to them. I forgot to mention, if you could drop your name and organization or affiliation in the chat just for our own purposes so we can um, capture that data for our reporting purposes. I see that a lot of people have done that, but if you haven't, please just drop your name in the chat with, with where you work. And thank you for that, Neil. I, I totally forgot what the minimum wage in San Francisco was, but I do think it's 15.32 an hour. Um, okay, so I'm gonna shut the chat and um, Julie or Kelly, if you don't mind monitoring the chat for me, that would be great but I will be checking the chat at the end of every section just to see if there's any questions. So just basic workplace rights. Oh, I guess I do cover it. I'm sorry, I haven't done this presentation in a while. Um, this may be outdated now, thanks to Neil, now that I know that, but all immigrants deserve minimum wage in the workplace. This is calculated based on what's most generous. So we know that the federal minimum wage is not raised in God knows how long. Um, but in California, it's 12, roughly $12 an hour as of 2019. Um, in San Francisco, it's now $16.32 an hour. So even though the California minimum wage is $12, if you work in San Francisco, you're entitled to the higher amount at all times. That's just a fun fact about labor rights. Um, overtime in California is calculated based on if you work more than eight hours in one day or 40 hours in a week. Um, of course, there's exceptions to this, as we all know, agricultural workers and domestic workers and certain categories of workers are just not covered in this, but mo mo for the most part, if someone works in the restaurant or if they work in construction, these rules should be, should be being followed. Um, everyone deserves breaks. It's a very common thing that immigrants don't ever take breaks. They don't ever take vacations. They don't ever take sick time, but all of those things are actually covered entitlements by law. Um, other forms of labor exploitation that often occur, labor wage and hour violations that occur is that there's a delay in payment, there's bounce payments, there's illegal deductions that occur from payments, um, including for things like 
reimbursement for supplies or uniforms, which should always be supplied by the, by the employer. But based on us working with immigrants, we know very often they buy their own safety equipment um, and that's completely illegal. <laughs> Other workplace rights that are just really common, maybe too common for you and me, is that everyone has the right to a safe and sanitary working environment. Your workplace should not be hostile or uncomfortable in any way. I can't tell you the number of immigrant women that have told me that they've experienced some type of sexual harassment or advancement in the workplace um, and don't do anything about it because they just don't realize they can. Um, any discrimination based on race, language, gender, nationality, or status is completely illegal. Um, contracts should always be given in native language and signed only after conditions are understood. And it is completely illegal for employers or companies to retaliate for work-related complaints but again, they frequently do. So does anyone have any questions before we continue at this point? Um, I, I do. <laughs> Is that Kelly? Sorry, let me turn to Kelly of you. So okay. I just wanna make it extra ultra clear. So even if someone doesn't have a work permit or work authorization via immigration or immigration status, they still have a right to all these things. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a really, I think it's super, when I learned it, I was shocked, obviously, right? But it is true. So like anyone who works in any kind of industry in the, any kind of legal industry, I should say, in the US. So yeah, if you work as a dishwasher in a restaurant in San Francisco, you should be getting all those rights, like respected and they shouldn't be violated. And if they are violated, even if someone's not a victim of trafficking, this is kind of like the thing that I like to tell people is that we should be screening for these things anyway, because we know the exploitation part is absolutely happening all the time. And I think it's really empowering for immigrants when they hear that these are their rights and like it should never have happened to them that they weren't paid on time or they had to pay for their own equipment or they weren't given breaks and that there's recourse. Because at the end of the day, I think economically, even recuperating wages lost or money lost is a really powerful thing to someone who may be living paycheck to paycheck. And at the end of this presentation, I actually do have a referral for just like good old labor exploitation where you can refer clients to for consult for, for employment and labor issues. Uh, for the purpose of this training that we're gonna be focusing on the immigration side of things or how to identify human trafficking for immigration purposes. Um, but yeah, everyone has these rights. <laughs> no matter who they are. Is there any other questions? Sorry, just to follow that. What did you mean by whether it's a legal industry or not? I will get into that. So illegal industries, so trafficking can occur in legal or illegal industries. And the best example of an illegal industry in which trafficking occurs is, is prostitution, right? Um, so anything that's underground, anything that is not documented is is considered like an underground um, form of labor trafficking. Uh, I'll, I'll go into an example of that, but like a classic example of that is people who are forced to peddle or beg, which is actually very common. <laughs> um, and that's it's not necessarily an illegal industry uh, because begging is not illegal, but it's an underground informal sector of society where people are still forced to work and their wages are somehow being collected. If that makes sense, but I'll, I'll be clarify that a little bit more in a second. Thanks. Marlon, did you have a question? I saw you, your hand go up. No? Okay. <laughs> um, again, the chat is off for me, but I will check it at the end of the section. So what is human trafficking and what is it not is the fun part. So these are some common myths about human trafficking that people often say to me. Um, and there's a huge list of them. So this is a two page slide, so bear with me. Um, people often think that human trafficking only involves sex work, but the actual legal definition is sex is commercial sex, people forced into commercial sex or providing their labor or services. So there's this entire bucket of labor trafficking, which is actually three and a half times more prevalent than sex work. And yet people just don't even recognize that that's also a crime that's occurring against people, even though it doesn't involve any type of prostitution or commercial sex. Um, people often think that human trafficking involves sexual or physical violence, 
I will say the vast majority of clients I've worked with over the last seven years as a licensed attorney have not experienced any kind of sexual or physical violence. It is often present in a lot of cases, but the majority of my cases in which someone was positively identified as a victim of trafficking did not involve any kind of like physical touching or harm to the person. Um, people often think that victims of human trafficking are mainly women or children. And I think that's neatly folded into the myth that human trafficking is just sex work. Um, again, the vast majority of my clients, and this is mostly because I focused on this, have been men forced into labor trafficking. Um, victims of trafficking have no freedom of movement. And in this slide, I'm using victims just because it's the myths page. So just FYI. <laughs> um, victims of human trafficking have no freedom of movement. I would say most of the cases I've worked on, I think when people think of human trafficking, they think of like people in a sweatshop who are then like locked away for the day or they're individuals who are like locked in a room and no one has the key. But in the, most of the cases I have, people have been able to leave the house, but that doesn't mean they were free to leave the work. And that's a really important distinction that we, I hope the examples will clarify. Um, in fact, I would say I'm very excited to be working with all of you because a major way in which clients have been referred to me is through the faith-based community because they continue going to church or mosques or synagogues here in this country because they don't know how, they don't know anybody else. And it's sometimes the only day off of the week that their employer gives them um, or it's the only place that their employer lets them go. And so having members of the faith-based community be equipped and educated to identify this type of crime is actually a huge asset to us because it's very hard for us to reach people who are working in people's homes, who are so in the shadows, who are so scared to talk to anybody. Um, so thank you again <laughs> for everyone who's here today. Uh, people often think that victims of human trafficking are all undocumented immigrants. That's also false. You can be a victim of human trafficking no matter what your status is. I would say the large, a large portion of individuals who are actually, who also who get reported, who fall into the category of commercial sex are actually US citizens, um, which is unusual for sure, but they tend to be like kids in foster care that get caught up in sex work. So this is a crime that can impact anybody. But again, because someone is undocumented, it's very easy to use the threat of deportation against them or the fear of deportation against them. So more often than not, this is a crime that impacts people who have that vulnerability factor. Uh, people often think that victims of trafficking are exploited, overworked and underpaid or not paid at all. While that is more likely than not what is happening, you can be a victim of trafficking and all the wage and hour laws are followed. And we'll go over an example of that, which is actually a really interesting thing that you can be not exploited, but still trafficked. Uh, people often think you can consent to being trafficked, but that's not true. You can't consent to something illegal <laughs> at all in any kind of way, shape or form. Um, human trafficking involves movement across borders. I think a lot of people assume that the people who end up being trafficked here were recruited abroad and were brought to this country with this specific intent, which is which can be true without a doubt. And then there's this whole other part of the population that came here on their own will or they're refugees in this country. And then they get caught in a situation where their employer is trapping them in a situation they feel like they can't leave. So it doesn't necessarily involve any kind of movement, which is one of the craziest things I learned about this work when I first started doing it um, is that you can be trafficked within your own home. It doesn't involve any kind of movement at all. That's not any kind of requisite. And then finally, um, again, indiv individuals must be brought here or recruited here into forced labor or sex in order to meet the definition. Um, you could be sitting in a park and someone could be offering you a job and it could end up being such a horrible situation. And, already in this country, um, and you could still be a victim of trafficking. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the impetus for why you ended up here. Um, but again, we'll go into that in just a second. Um, so human trafficking, I'm not gonna read you all the slides, but I hope it's all clear. And if it's not, please let me know. Um, human trafficking basically occurs anywhere, anywhere there are immigrants working. 
Um, it occurs in the most progressive of cities. It occurs in the most rural places. It occurs everywhere. And this is the part, Kelly, where it also includes informal work too. So an illegal work can include selling drugs or bringing goods across the border or trans transporting illegal substances. Um, it could also include non-traditional work like begging or peddling or food stands, and of course, commercial sex or prostitution. Because my work focuses largely on people who have had contact with the criminal justice system, most of my clients have been forced into some type of illegal work, more likely than not selling drugs. And it's really crazy to me how often just not even asking the right questions, like did someone force you to do this, land somebody in federal custody and then in deportation proceedings and then deported, all for crimes they were forced to commit, which is outrageous to me, but it is currently the way in which our criminal justice system is working. So who are traffickers um, in our modern era? They're not like some evil guy with a mustache who's like trying to scheme and has like, you know, it's not like some nefarious person that we're looking out for. The actual definition is anyone who knowingly benefits from the forced labor services. So I think the important thing is to look to the person or entity, sometimes a corporation or company, exerting control over the survivor and ask, how are or were they leveraging their control or power over that individual? I think when you start with that framework, it makes it a lot easier to see who the characters are in play and therefore make an assessment over whether or not someone may fall into this category. It could include other undocumented individuals, family members, companies, owners of businesses, criminal enterprises like drug cartels or governments and politicians. Um, uh -huh. Sorry, did someone take themselves off mute? Does it does it always include um, the threat of deportation? Is that part of it? No, it doesn't always. I'll go over that in, in, in a later slide. I just keep referring back to that because it's, it's the most innocuous type of threat that one could get. Like, it's not physically harming you. It's not saying, I'm going to kill you. It's saying, like, I'm going to call immigration on you. And even though that may seem really like innocent or just kind of like something in passing that one would say, it actually creates a crazy climate of fear in someone's mind who's undocumented, who thinks this employer will legitimately call immigration on me if I stop working for them. And that is like kind of the mental prison that's created in a trafficking situation. And we'll go into examples about that to like clarify what I mean by that. But I keep referring to that because it is so common and yet getting that type of threat actually elevates this crime from something like exploitation or extortion or smuggling into trafficking if that and i'll clarify i'm sorry if i'm not being exceedingly clear right now but i will in a second hopefully um i've so i've worked on cases where where different types where i've had like the husband be the trafficker which is a crazy thing with domestic violence and human trafficking um, I've had other undocumented individuals traffic other undocumented individuals. We've had companies and corporations do this. I think a really big case in San Francisco um, involving Hyatt, whatever big hotel is right on Embarcadero, it's either the Marriott or Hyatt or one of them. Um, they were using um, H2B workers, which is unlicensed, it's sorry, excuse me, unskilled temporary workers. They had like a, they recruited laborers in Mexico and they brought them to Hayward and they were staying in Hayward and then they were being transported every day to Embarcadero to work in construction um, and then transported back to this warehouse in Hayward. And that was basically their schedule every day. So they were here legally. They were here on a legal visa. They were working for a legitimate company. Um, on the surface, everything seems like it's being followed, but then when you actually talk to the men about the things that they were being told, it was very much like they had no choice but to abide by these like conditions and standards because they were so scared of the consequences if they stopped working or they tried to complain. Um, and in that situation, what advocates have argued is that a company like the Hyatt should have definitely known who their supply chain was and who their laborers were. And so they knowingly benefited from the forced labor. Um, in that situation, obviously, I don't know what happened with that case, but you could theoretically 
call the trafficker the hotel chain as well, which is actually more common than one thing. I think hospitality workers is one of the largest traffic groups in the country. Um, yeah, that's kind of the lowdown of like the big macro framework of how we're gonna, and then we're gonna work our way down to hopefully the details of it. Um, these are pretty common scenarios in which how in which how immigrant community members fall prey to human trafficking. Sometimes at the border, uh, their coyote or their guide will offer will say that they have to carry a backpack or goods across the border. Otherwise, they're going to be abandoned in the desert. And that act of doing that kind of service even once qualifies you as a victim of human trafficking. I'm not saying it qualifies you for immigration relief, but it does qualify you at least to get to talk to an attorney. It, I mean, it doesn't qualify you to talk to an attorney. If you do see something like that, it would warrant talking to an attorney about what their actual legal options are. So the point of this is not for any of you to do a full legal analysis. It's just to be like, oh, I think I actually know a case like this, or oh, when a case like this occurs, I know who to call to refer this client for hopefully a full consultation where they can actually be appraised of their full legal rights. <clears throat> Sometimes at the border, um, coyotes will demand more money um, or they'll state that if you don't pay us more money, you're gonna have to work in the US in order to repay this debt that you owe us. Um, and that's really, really common. And more often than not, clients will end up in the US, they'll end up in these safe houses and they'll end up working like cooking, or if they're women, they'll end up taking care of other children who are in these safe houses for the other coyotes' children. It, it turns into like this domestic worker situation where this person is now working under duress to repay a debt, a supposed debt they owe. And that, again, it's human trafficking. It's a form of domestic work that someone's forced to do against their will, where they're actually trapped and they have no other option. Um, in the US, survivors are lured into jobs <clears throat> under certain promises, but the reality will be the reality of the situation is different than the promises made. Um, in the US, survivors are offered help, um, food or housing, bond payments, legal status, and then tricked into situations. I actually have a number of clients, not a number, but I have a few clients right now that I'm working with who had their bond paid by like a random third family member or like a excuse me, like a third party friend or somebody like that. Um, and so they were released from jail for immigration detention. And this person who paid their bond then leveraged that against them and said, like, you owe me. Like, I did this for you, now you owe me. And that's actually really crazy how common it is. And you can only imagine how hard that must be if you're in jail and someone's offering to help you and then later on they use that against you. But it is unfortunately more common than we think it is. Um, and then finally, another common scenario that often occurs in my, in my practice is that survivor family members or relatives um, force, them to force them to work in repayment or a debt or loan incurred for that person traveling to the US. So in a lot of situations with refugees who are very desperate to leave their country, family members or friends in the US will loan them money or like help them get here, or even sometimes like coax them into coming to the US saying like, oh, you can find a better life here, I'll help you pay. But then as soon as the person's in the US and like separated from their family, separated from their culture, isolated, um, the tables turn and those family members end up being the people that abuse them again in this country in even more heinous ways. <clears throat> Oh, sorry. Are there any questions at this point before I continue on? I know I'm going kind of fast. I just wanted, I just, just to, uh, uh, organizational question. Are you going to be sharing the slides with us? I can definitely do that. Okay, good. Then I'll, I won't have to write as much. No, please don't write as much. You can definitely have my slides. <laughs> Thank you, Art. So how do traffickers or abusers overpower and maintain control over immigrants? And this is where we're gonna go into the threat of deportation a little bit more, Marlon, and hopefully these methods of control will clarify the very 
very like subtle ways in which power actually is being leveraged in these situations. Um, so the legal definition says that you have to be providing these labor or services under force, fraud, and coercion. Force is, is the using of physical force or sexual abuse, um, isolation or confinement, including withholding of a passport. I think a lot of times people don't realize that when you take someone's ID document away, it's actually kind of like taking their ball and chain and like holding them hostage with it. Um, other ways of force that I've seen in my cases is like monitoring movements or having cameras to watch work. Um, and then finally controlling where someone lives or who they speak to. So sometimes traffickers will require that someone lives in a certain house or place, um, or they'll be over vigilant about who that person is talking to or make a lot of warnings that they shouldn't talk to anyone here, that they shouldn't trust anyone here, that anyone could be the police here. Um, and so I think the big question with force is that, were there any physical barriers actually preventing this person from leaving the situation? If you're like encountering someone in your in your congregation or in your communities and they kind of are showing some red flags, I think this is like a really important question to ask yourself. It's just like, oh, does this person actually seem like they physically cannot leave the situation for some reason? Uh, fraud is kind of the way I like to conceptualize it is just false promises or obviously things that lies, basically, basically lies. Um, this could be false promises regarding employment, gaining legal papers, wages, working conditions, love, marriage, or even a better life. Um, a situation could start off very loving, as, as many of you probably know in domestic violence situations, that could be the situation as well, like a parallel example, and then it could get worse over time. So it doesn't need to be like bad from the get-go, it could eventually become a human trafficking situation. Um, and these are all different types of false promises that abusers have used in cases that I've worked on to lure someone or to keep someone from leaving. So I think a good question to ask yourself as, as to whether there was fraud involved is was what was promised in the reality situation different than what the individual expected. And then this is the big catch all is coercion and intimidation. Um, coercion is actually defined legally as I'm not gonna get into the exact legal definition, but conceptually the way coercion is framed in law is any harm, like anything that would cause harm to someone who's reasonably situated in the same situation. And what that means is, is that did the person genuinely believe the threats or false information that their abuser was telling them? And that is why they continued to work even though they didn't want it to leave. And more often than not, in almost all our cases, that includes threats to immigration or deportation or the police. Then of course, I think other threats are like a little bit more obvious. Like I'm gonna hurt your child, or I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take your children away, I'm gonna gain custody of your children, or I'm gonna like kill your kids abroad, right? Like those are very obvious types of threats that would keep someone there. But the big one is actually like, I'm gonna call immigration against you, or I'm gonna have you deported that are very, very, very common in immigrant communities and immigrant workplaces. Um, I say the whole thing about what a reasonable person would believe because I've actually worked on cases that involved clients who had certain religious beliefs that I didn't have, um, where they actually believed that you could get curses put on you if you didn't behave a certain way. And traffickers have actually used those types of beliefs against somebody. So they've told them, like, if you try to leave the situation, I'm going to put a curse on you. And because my client was deeply religious and deeply involved in this religion, she actually believed that threat. And so even though someone like me probably wouldn't believe that because it's not my faith, someone like her did. And that actually did count as trafficking because she genuinely believed as someone in her situation that there would be harm caused to her if she stopped providing her services. Um, more like subtle, even more subtle ways in which this occurs is indirect forms of intimidation can also lead to an individual feeling trapped. So showing someone guns or telling them they have guns, repeatedly saying that like, I'm a US citizen, I have rights and you don't. Um, if someone is dependent on their employer for room or board, they're faced with the false choice of having to be homeless or continue a situation that's egregious. That's also a form of coercion. Um, 
or threatening somebody because their employment status is actually tied to their employer, which is actually a very common situation with like H2A workers who are unskilled agricultural workers or H2B, like in the construction example I was giving earlier. Um, these are temporary work visas, which is which are used to have seasonal labor in the US for when there's shortages. Um, What's interesting is that even though Trump took a huge stance against immigration, the number of these immigrant, the quotas for these immigrant categories actually went up during the Trump years. So it's very, very obvious that these visas make a vulnerable situation even more vulnerable because they, the immigrant who comes on these visas is actually tied to the employer. So if I'm an H-2A worker who came to work for Dole in Fresno or the Central Valley, um, and I don't like working for Dole anymore. If I try to find another job at like a neighboring farm, I automatically fall out of status and become undocumented. And that alone can be so coercive to somebody who doesn't actually understand their labor rights here. And especially under coming off of a Trump era, where the last thing you want to be is in such a vulnerable position where you could be deported. It actually creates a huge climate of psychological climate of fear in someone's mind that even though they don't like how they're being treated, they feel like they have no other option but to continue. So is there any questions regarding any of the stuff that I'm saying so rapidly to, any, to all of you? Kelly, you took yourself off mute. Do you have a question? Well, I'm just processing it. I thought it was interesting. It says dependent on employer for room and board mm -hmm. so wouldn't it be normal that if someone stops working somewhere but they're getting room and board that that room and board goes away it is really normal i think so it's not necessary i think for you for your purposes of like just like red flagging something and referring red flagging an individual as a potential survivor or like even somebody who's potentially just faced a bad work situation I like to flag the dependent on work employer for room and board because it it is kind of a false choice, right? To tell somebody like, I'm gonna treat you really badly, but you really have no other option of where to go. And it's not necessarily going to qualify somebody for a T visa, which is a, traffic, a special visa category um, for survivors of trafficking in this country, but it will get them to a consult with an attorney who can actually make a full case analysis of it. And more often than not, when someone is dependent on their employer for room or board, they're likely to be in a more desperate situation to continue doing something they don't want to be doing. It's not necessarily like every single person who's dependent on their employer for room and board is in a situation like this. It just creates an additional factor that that could like raise, my, it would raise my red flags. If someone was like, oh yeah, I'm living with my employer and I really hate my job, I would be like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, if that makes sense. And then, I mean, it would obviously, if you really wanted to go into the nuts and bolts of it, it would actually go into more like, is that employer using the fact that you live with them against you? How are they using, like, that would be like my consult process with them. Um, but for now, we just want to actually raise all the red flags over all the various things that make someone feel really desperate to stay in a situation they don't want to stay in. Kelly? Um, we may have had that situation, which drove uh, one of our uh, families that we were, you know, accompanying to IM4HI. Um, that may have been their situation before they came to us, and, and you know, IM4HI was the remedy to get out of that situation. Yeah. Julie and Neil, you both raised your hands. Do you have anything further? Go ahead. Well, I guess you might be getting, going to get into this, but I just um, am really interested in if, you know, if we, if it's discovered that there is a situation like this, that actually that can help people to have a, a valid reason to be able to, to legalize their status here. And I, is that true? Like, could you clarify your question a little? Sorry. Uh, sorry. No, well, you're good. You're good. If, if somebody is a victim of human trafficking um labor trafficking 
might that be a way apart from like seeking asylum or something else it's a, mm -hmm. a way to legalize their status are you going to talk about that yes i will i will definitely talk about that i'll talk about all the legal remedies that are available for someone who's actually positively identified as a human trafficking survivor okay. Okay. um and yeah I, I and i'll go into why it's so important and i appreciate your time so much it's like part of my sales pitch in the work i do <laughs> um are there any other questions? Neil, you also had your hand up. Was it just to comment on the, the situation you knew about? Okay. Um, so another common thing that I see now, uh, now that I'm working more with day laborers is that employers will often threaten a day laborer or a construction worker with suing them for unfinished work, which is also illegal. Um, so a lot of my clients that are like working on these construction projects, like you get hired to like, lay the foundation on someone's home right and then the employer is like okay well you laid the foundation but our whole job was for you to lay the foundation and put the flooring in and so they'll start adding on these jobs that were not part of the original contract if there was ever an original contract for a day laborer and eventually the employer the american will say something like well if you don't finish this work i'm just going to sue you for all the unfinished work and that's also a threat that's completely false. That's not how labor laws are supposed to work. That's not how employment laws are supposed to work. But that false threat of like utilizing the law in a way that it wasn't intended to be utilized, the immigrant doesn't know that. They don't speak the language here. They don't realize that. They think this American who knows the laws here, who understands it, actually does have the ability to sue them for money they don't even have. And so... That's another common form of coercion, which is just a threat. It doesn't involve any kind of physical violence or verbal abuse or anything, but it's enough to make someone stay and continue working in a situation they don't want to continue working in. So here is a case study that we're going to work on together. If you could take a, like a minute to read this through, um, we'll talk about what you all think is the forced labor that's occurring and how this employer might have kept Van in the situation, in a situation that he did not want to be in. So I'm just going to give you like a minute to review this. Is everyone ready? Okay. So just you guys can all just blurt it out or like take yourselves off mute to let me know what in the situation, what kind of labor was Dan actually forced to do? Like what are the labor and services in this case example? Fishing and fishing for something different from mm -hmm. what he originally contracted for. Yep, exactly. He was forced to fish and forced to fish for something he was not contracted for. In what ways did Van's employer keep him in the situation? Then to throw him overboard, he didn't give him uh, adequate protective gear for his work. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't pay him what he said he was. Oh. There were multiple. There's definitely multiple violations. Broken laws. Telling him he'd have to pay a fee in order to stop working. Yep. So here's here's my analysis of it. Um, here, so in the yellow, the yellow represents the actual forced labor. The orange is kind of the forced fraud or coercion, and the underlying parts are just the actual labor violations that also occurred in this situation. So in this oops, excuse me, in this situation, Van was forced to fish for something that was not contracted. Um, however, the fact that it was not contracted isn't necessarily what makes it human trafficking, but it's just another violation we want to flag. Um, Dan was in the middle of the ocean. Like, really, where could he go? <laughs> Even if his employer didn't tell him he was going to throw him over, like, what was his other option to stop working and be on the ship in the middle of nowhere? 
So it's definitely a form of force. And then the other part of the coercion is that he would break the contract and he would have to pay a $5,000 fee for expenses incurred. So Art, while your, your intuition about flagging all the violations is correct in terms of what I would do as an attorney, I would take all these things, all the violations, and I would draft his application. But for just the preliminary screening, his violations are actually irrelevant, most likely or not. The only thing that we really care about was that he was forced to do some type of work against his will. And like, how was that against his will actually manifesting? And in this situation, it was you were isolated in the middle of the ocean and your employer told you that you have to pay a fee of $5,000 to break this contract. Oh. Um, this is an actual case of somebody who docked in San Francisco and was able to escape once they were docked in San Francisco, um, but they were trafficked for quite some time on this fishing ship. So, a really simple practical working definition that I like to use is that human trafficking is a situation in which one, in which one feels forced or threatened into providing their labor or services, not just their salary, to another person or group of people because they are scared of the harm or consequences they believe will follow if they do not obey or comply with the type of work which is being demanded. If someone is benefiting from threatening, scaring, or forcing me into doing some type, is, is the, the question becomes like, is someone forcing, it's not phrase, this is not phrase, this is phrase in the first person, but I guess for all of you, it would be like, is someone benefiting from threatening, scaring, or forcing this individual into doing some type of work? Um, here's another case example. It's a little longer, so I'm going to give you a full minute to read it, and then we will talk about it. <laughs> I'm going to give you make some space by giving you this all right so I can't see everyone's screen because I'm on full screen right now but in this situation with Radhika who do you, what do you think the leap starting backwards what was the labor and services provided it could be multiple things she could be doing multiple jobs <laughs> Taking care of children, cooking, cleaning, bathing, mm -hmm. laundry, yard work. Is there anything else that she was forced to do? It sounds like that was probably it. Well, drop off and pick up children and run errands. Okay. And how, how did Mr. Surya keep Radhika in the situation? Well, first he took her passport mm -hmm. and, and then he intimidated her by saying he could, that the police arrest people for anything. So left her more scared when she's out of the house. That's exactly right. So we're gonna go to the next slide where I, I kind of outlined this a little bit, my, my legal analysis, if this is my highlighter. Um, the yellow again represents the domestic work that she was forced to do, the labor and services she was forced to provide. The orange represents the various ways in which she was controlled. So yes, he confiscated her passport right away, um, which as we went over earlier, taking someone's ID is actually a very, definitely a form of force under, force under the law. Um, another thing that he did was that he monitored her movements. So when she would return home, he would often ask where she'd been. And as you said, 
she he he basically instilled a fear in her that the police could be anyone and that you should be really scared and be careful who you talk to. So it created an iso- like a, a situation of isolation around her where she actually didn't talk to anyone. She did go to church regularly, but she didn't talk to anyone in this situation. Um, she's entitled to wage an hour relief as well as immigration. And the thing that I want to highlight here is that he offered her a job taking care of his young child in the U.S. for eight dollars an hour for six months. So even though that was part of the original contract that he had offered her, someone from India who eight dollars an hour is significantly more than what you can make in India. It's completely illegal to contract with somebody in a way that violates our own wage and hour laws. So this contract in and of itself was pretty illegal in the way he recruited her and offered her this job too. Um, again, not something that you need to go into analysis about, but just just various red flags that occur in these cases that when I hear facts like this, I immediately am like, okay, like something fishy was going on here. Um, Also, he uh, deducted money for uh, the debt that she was, he had for the passport travel costs and visa, which he hadn't apparently told her about. Mm -hmm. And even if he told her about it, it could still be illegal. So like, again, deductions for like, things like room and board or for travel costs or even for deductions for like protective equipment. All of that to me, when I hear it, like when I'm just talking to people in the community, it automatically raises red flags that something more fishy could have been going on. And this person is entitled to a consult to see if there was something more fishy going on in their particular case. Um, This was actually a case I worked on in New York when I was still a law student and it became like a huge case with the Indian government because uh, her, the consulate officer who was trafficking my, my client who was working as a domestic worker started threatening her family in India and it became like this huge thing. Um, But a good example of somebody who entered here on a legal visa an A1 visa who was trafficked by like an actual government official and who for the most part didn't have that many wage and hour violations, but still could not leave their situation by any means and felt exceedingly isolated. Um, So this is the tricky thing that often a question gets asked to me is like, is something trafficking or is it just exploitation? Um, I think there's a huge difference between these things because I work in, in this area of the law so much that the line is a little bit more obvious to someone like me. But, I, but it's so not obvious if you're not seeing these patterns all the time. So I think there's a huge difference between somebody who says like, oh, I continued working for this guy because I didn't feel like I could get another job or it was really hard for me to get this job in the first place because I don't have status. Um, versus someone who says, my employer said that if I tried to get another job, I would be blacklisted or deported. Um, And if you could hear the difference in those two, right? In one of them, the employer is leveraging a threat or coercion against the person to keep them there. In another situation, the person is unfortunately in in a very difficult economic situation where they have to choose between a rock and a hard place. But if it came down to it, they could leave that job. And that's the biggest difference is that they could leave that job where the only harm they would incur is an economic one, not one that would hurt their status or they feel like they would get a curse put on them or there would actually be some physical harm to themselves or somebody they cared about. Um, Another common exploitation versus trafficking uh, scenario is that I filed a complaint against my boss after he fired me and because of that he threatened to call immigration on me, which is very different than my boss told me that if I didn't finish my work, he would take me to court. So in one situation, it's like the person is continuing working for the person and they can't stop. In the other one, it's like a a retaliation. That's completely legal, the retaliation, but it doesn't make something human trafficking. Um, Another common threat that is like, my employer told me that they would call immigration if I didn't do what they wanted. That's a direct way in which the threat is being leveraged to force someone to do something they don't want to do. And I hope this is making it a little bit more clear, though it probably will never be completely clear and it's never completely clear to me either. <laughs> it's always a case by case analysis. But again, if you do hear anything that occurs on the right, like somebody threatening to keep someone in a situation, 
that warrants a referral to our program or another type of attorney that can actually do a more full depth analysis with that person. Here's another case study that we can go over to like kind of cement these things that I'm talking about. Um, I'll give you a minute to read through it and then we'll go over it together. Can you make it bigger? Thank you. Is that I found part? that I was too in, small. I found. Did I make it bigger or smaller? That made it smaller. Yeah. Okay, give me one second. Show, I think. Sorry. I found that I am also able to make my own screen bigger using my mouse and or touch in various ways. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. Give me one second. Um, Just because it's not in presentation mode. Okay. There. Oh wait. Well, let me get all the way back to that slide. Oops. Okay, we're Thank here. You. Okay. Thank you, everybody. All those faces. I did that, of course. You can do everything you want. You can express any. So, what type of labor or services was Alex providing? Well, it's providing, you know, manual manual labor, and for a great deal, and he received a great deal less pay than was offered. Mm -hmm. So it was on false false promises there. Um, he also had the substandard living. Um, not that who knows what he'd been promised about that, but um, and then the the uh, being and then he was charged, of course, and deducted for transportation for which he had no other way of getting to work. Um, and then he lived under um, a constant threat that if he didn't do his work, if he ever took a break, that uh, or or took too long to eat, um, he had no recourse. He also had no freedom from where he lived. Those are all very true, for sure. Um, does anyone else want to talk about any types of coercion or force or fraud that they see in this this fact pattern? <laughs> That threat to uh, that threat to lose uh, uh, your uh, documentation and mm -hmm. uh, which is not even I don't think is even accurate, but that threat to do that uh, is what would keep you in the job for fear of, of being deported. Yeah, and I think the idea of being blacklisted to anybody who is not from the US. It sounds kind of crazy to be blacklisted from this country, but that's actually a very real fear that a lot of temporary work, tempor particularly people who depend on temporary seasonal work here, get really, really afraid that they'll never be able to come back here again. Um, and then that fear can become even more compounded when their traffic care requires them to pay for travel costs because they more likely than not took out a loan to pay for travel costs that they're unable to completely pay if they are not unable to earn US dollars at any point in time. Um, so <clears throat> there's a lot of, a lot of violations in this case, this real life case scenario. Um, but I'm just going to show you what it's like when you take away a couple facts and how much it changes the fact pattern. So in this situation, we took out the fact that he was not required. He was offered a place to live. Um, and it wasn't substandard. We don't even know what it was in the situation. We have no idea what his facts were. Um, and that he was not transported to work every day. 
Um, they also, we also taking out the fact that they threatened to, to blacklist him if he, if he didn't continue doing their work and that Alex had no way of leaving the warehouse. So in this fact pattern, we changed a lot of things that are really subtle, but it actually makes a huge difference in terms of doing a trafficking analysis. In this situation, there's still wage and hour as well as labor violations occurring left and right. And this person should definitely talk to an employment and labor attorney. But as far as it rising to the level of human trafficking, when you take out certain key facts, um, there is no more force, fraud, or coercion in an obvious way. Perhaps there is. Perhaps he could talk to an attorney and there would be something coming up that's not, doesn't fit on this life. But I hope the crossing out of certain things kind of gives you an idea of how when you take away certain facts, it can actually change the whole pattern and analysis of the situation. A question? Mm -hmm. why, why would you do that? Why would you remove those yeah. factors which which seem to be to allow the um the migrant a much less opportunity so um, yeah in this situation i was just doing it to illustrate that if like th these things weren't a part of alex's story anymore that he was actually just somebody who was recruited who was offered a place to live who worked 14 hours days on this hotel renovation project getting eight dollars an hour um but he wasn't actually like trapped. He was able to leave the situation. He was still being exploited. But the key difference here is that he, there was no like climate of fear being created around him or isolation around him, where if he wanted, he could actually leave the situation. And I think that's the biggest thing in doing a human trafficking identification is like, could this person actually leave? Why or why not? Um, Another thing that we talked about earlier is a very common way in which immigrants end up in these situations. And as I talked about earlier, two common scenarios are at the border, the guide or coyote will make the person carry something across the border um, and or they'll tell them that they owe more money. And so they'll have to pay back that money by working in the US. Um, those two things that I just said, that you'll have to work in the US or that you'll have to carry something for us across the border. The carrying something across the border is a form of work and services. The working in the US is a form of work and services. Whereas with smuggling or extortion, that type of labor and services is not actually present. It's, and I'm gonna go into this a little bit more, but I'm just talking broadly about the ways in which some what we're talking about when we say forced labor at these like border cases. Um, smuggling is different than trafficking. <clears throat> smuggling is actually when you smuggle someone into the US, it's a crime against the border, whereas trafficking is a crime against the person. Um, you can be somebody who smuggled into this country and a victim of trafficking, but they are not, they are not the same term is the only thing I really want to emphasize right now. Um, Hopefully this case example will clarify what I'm saying. So if you wanna take a minute to read through it and then we'll go over it together. All right, so in this situation, um, Josue was a young kid who was fleeing gang violence in his home country and hired a coyote. What was the forced labor that Josue was forced to do in this situation, if any? There doesn't have to be forced labor. There were two things. One, he was, he was forced to work to pay back more than he had originally contracted with the coyote. Mm -hmm. and then he was also um, coerced into smuggling two people across. Um, mm -hmm. 
which would be work coercion as well. That's exactly true. I think that's a big thing that people often miss in this presentation is that, yes, he was forced to smuggle people in. And so him acting as a coyote is a form of labor and services as it would fall under something in the illegal or informal industry. Um, I'm gonna like move to the next slide. So I think- Can I ask you something? Um, how, how would people ever prove these things? Like, you know, they forced me to carry this thing versus I just did it of my own accord. Yeah. Right. Are you, are, are you, is everyone on this presentation familiar with asylum law and how it gets played out and how there's never any really proof in asylum cases? Like there's nothing but the person's word, right? Um, same thing with trafficking cases. When you're filing for immigration relief, the, it's even, it's even nicer than asylum because there is no interview or adversary, adversarial process. So with asylum, you either have an asylum officer who then does an interview with you and cross checks all the things that you said, um, or you're facing an immigration judge who, and you're subject to cross-examination and other things for fact checking and credibility. In trafficking cases, there's nothing like that. It's actually, you just send in an application, a paper application and someone reads it and makes a decision. So the client's story and working with the client is actually the bulk of what my work is, is getting a like a solid declaration that kind of talks about this climate of fear that the person was feeling for the work and services that they felt compelled to do. Does that answer your question? And um, the, perp the perpetrator of the crime here, the, the coyote, is, is not American. He's uh, presumably is, is a Mexican citizen or he lives in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So it's all about um, uh, show, demonstrating that the survivor is actually was, I don't know, what was acted against by, by a person who even wasn't an, Amer an American citizen. And yet still he has, he has certain rights because of the way he was basically abused. Yeah, so in this situation, again, I took out certain facts here, not that I took them out um, because they weren't beneficial to the client, I'm just changing the fact pattern to show you how changing certain facts can actually alter the whole fact pattern completely. So we work a lot with unaccompanied minor children and it's so common, too common for them to be facing something like this. And in, the, in a lot of cases, they are actually a victim of trafficking, but in a lot more cases, they're actually the victim of kidnapping, extortion, or any other number of crimes that are not human trafficking. Um, so in this situation, when we take out the fact that Josue was told that he would have to work for a few weeks for with Paco to like pay back the debt, when we take that out as a fact completely, and then we just make it that his sister eventually paid the coyote, the money they were demanding, this becomes a case of kidnapping and extortion, but unfortunately not human trafficking. And I say unfortunately only because of the immigration benefits that follow when you are a victim of trafficking. There are no unfortunate benefits when you are the victim of extortion and all other heinous crimes that occur on the border, unfortunately do not qualify you for, for any kind of relief in this country. Um, we also took out the fact pattern that he was told that he had to smuggle anyone into this, this country or that he was even slammed with alien smuggling. Um, in this situation, he was apprehended by border officials and put into OR custody. So Josue in this situation was kidnapped and he was definitely extorted, but he was not a victim of trafficking. If you take out these key facts that he was told he would have to work for Paco and that he actually did smuggle people into the US. I hope that makes it a little bit clearer in terms of how these things can actually change with very subtle facts changing. Um, here's another case scenario that's kind of similar. If you want to just take a minute to read that.
Sorry. I always find it hard to find my mute button on this thing. Um, so I'm gonna jump to the next slide just because we're running short on time. So we can go over the things that Maria had to do. So in this situation, um, Maria was trafficked in two different ways. She was trafficked at the border for one week when she cleaned houses where she was being held. Um, and then she was trafficked again in the US in Oakland after she started living with her husband and he would arrange jobs for her collecting arranging jobs for her cleaning where he collected all her payments. Earlier, I said trafficking is when you provide your labor and services, not necessarily your payment. That is true. Just because someone's extorting you for your money doesn't mean they're trafficking you. The key thing with trafficking is that someone's forcing you to work somewhere against your will. In this situation, this would be a thing where an attorney would work with the client because there is the government will push back on the fact that this might have been just domestic violence and not human trafficking. But because her husband retained so much control over her in other ways, and he was the one exclusively finding these jobs for her, he was, in a sense, eliciting her labor and services for his sole benefit. Um, and all the orange kind of highlights the ways in which he did that. He would threaten to have her deported. He threatened to have full custody of her children. Um, he would make her scared of the cops. All of these things were ways in which her partner utilized false threats of the legal process against her to make her believe that she would suffer real consequences if she didn't keep doing these jobs he arranged for her and keep giving him her wages. But even outside of that, what happened to her at the border where she was forced to work until her partner actually came up with the money also would qualify her as a victim of trafficking. So in this situation, she was trafficked in two different ways by two different people. Um, here we change a little bit of the facts and I highlighted those in green. Um, so the underlying, excuse me, the underlying immediately her and her daughters were taken hostage awaiting the money. That's again, not trafficking. It's a form of a kidnapping and extortion. Um, and here we change the facts a little bit where she found her own job at a restaurant and she would still give her partner all her money that she earned. But here the situation's a little different because she could actually leave that job at the restaurant if she wanted. Even though like we could argue obviously that her, if her husband continued to have any kind of domestic violence or control over her, maybe it wasn't as clean cut as we're thinking it would be. I'm just giving you like the scenarios that you may encounter to see, like I'm doing this in a way that hopefully highlights the very faint line that exists between these various crimes and what make what makes someone human a human sur survivor of human trafficking versus a survivor of other types of crimes. So I hope that's a little bit clear. And here again, I highlighted that she ended up working 12 hours a day without any overtime. That's a wage and hour violation, which again is against the law, but it's not necessarily doesn't make her a victim of human trafficking. Um, so the big fun part of this is how do you actually talk to people who may have been in these crimes or may, may have experienced this type of violence in their life? And why is this so important? So this is actually a slide I should include maybe in the beginning of my presentation. So under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which was passed in 2000 by Congress, there are four different types of benefits that a victim of trafficking can get in this country. Civil remedies, which include lost wages, broken contracts or other workplace violations so the person the individual who was actually the victim could actually sue their perpetrators for lost wages and other things that they should have been paid which can be very empowering to somebody who may have recently escaped the situation and has no other has no other type of money um, or it could just be a form of justice to somebody is to actually get the money they deserve there's criminal recourse including protection such as restraining orders or custody and there's prosecution, which is pressing charges against the abuser. This is completely out of the hands of the individual. This is entirely in law enforcement's hands. And this is not something I really like to get into because I'm not someone who likes to say the police are actually there to protect us, but it is a form of, of recourse that does exist by law. This is the fun part for me. Um, you can be qualified for immigration relief. In the US, the TVPA, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, created two categories of visas victims of crime in the US. One was the U visa, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. 
It is a visa which broadly defines certain categories of crimes, including domestic violence, including human trafficking. So if you're a victim of those crimes, you can apply for a U visa if you cooperate with the police and report to them. That visa category has an annual cap of 10,000. I think last year or maybe the year before, before COVID, the number of applications they received exceeded like 60,000. So currently the U visa wait list, because there's a cap on this visa, is about 10 years. So even if we apply today and our, our client is completely qualified for this form of relief, it will take them 10 years to actually get any kind of documentation, which is crazy. The T visa, which was created in parallel with the U visa, but specifically for victims of human trafficking, has an annual cap of 5,000 and it's never been reached. So the most applications ever filed was in 2014, I believe, and it was roughly 1,100 applications. So this visa category has existed for 20 years and it's never reached the cap that Congress thought it would reach annually, which to me does not indicate that this crime is not occurring. It to me it indicates that we're really not doing a good job screening for this type of crime, especially considering this form of relief pre-Trump used to get adjudicated within six months. So it's an extremely powerful thing that can get someone's status within six months that doesn't subject them to an adversarial setting like asylum does, um, and which comes with many public benefits, unlike the U visa. So in California, as soon as I positively identify someone, me as an attorney, positively identify someone as a victim of human trafficking, I can actually write a letter to social services where in California, they're entitled to start getting benefits right away for eight months without any kind of status, which is incredible for someone who's trying to leave a really broken situation for them to get housing support, medical support, house, uh, money support, case management support is huge. And this is like such an undertap pot of money that's been allocated for this population that again, doesn't access this, this type of money or these services because they themselves, no immigrant is like, oh yeah, I'm a victim of human trafficking. If you and I don't understand this like nuanced area of the law, it's really beyond someone to ever label themselves this way and like proactively seek services. But there are many services that are actually entitled, they're, in, they're available and these individuals are entitled to by law. So my big push for this is that we actually want to reach that cap. We actually want to start doing these comprehensive services these comprehensive screenings, these inclusive assessments, because these crimes are occurring and they're occurring even more now in the ways in which our political economy is moving. Um, so yeah, it's super powerful. It's really amazing. It's something I hope we can increase utilizing as a tool in our tool belt to help immigrants actually get status. Um, and unlike asylum, so if your child has been trafficked, you can petition for your parents, you can petition for your siblings, if you are an adult with children, and even if they're abroad, um, you can petition for your whole family. So it provides even more broad family reunification than asylum does. It's, it's a pretty neat thing that exists that I just don't think people utilize because they don't understand what trafficking means, quite frankly. So that's my big plug <laughs> for why this is important. Um, I think as people who interact with immigrant communities in passing, I think these are some big red flags that maybe if you're in a safe place to talk to them about, you could probe them a little bit more. But when I, when I see any of these things occurring, to me as somebody who moves through immigrant communities that works with them in various capacities, any of these things automatically flag me to ask more questions. And I'm not gonna go over this, like if you said yes to any of these questions because we're running out of time. Um, but I think the big question is, do you know someone who has felt scared or unable to leave their employer or stop working in a particular situation because they were scared of the consequences? Um, we have two case examples here that I'm not gonna go over just because we don't, we're, not, we're running out of time. But that's kind of like the macro question that we should all be carrying in our heads. It's like, was this person in a situation that they felt they could not leave because they were scared of the consequences? And what were those consequences? Um, I would suggest as always, not that I have to tell this particular group, something like this, but to be humble in your role. So it's to inform, not give legal advice. Um, mm -hmm. Do not make judgments or decisions for others. Like even if someone's in a horrible situation, it's not our job to like 
be like, you need to get out of this, right? It's our job to show them that there is a door, that there is legal recourse, and that there actually are attorneys who will have their back should they choose to leave the situation or should they choose to get help. Um, our goal is empowerment through education, and we sincerely hope that if people know more about this information and that there are legal resources, that they will themselves come forward. Uh, we always want to emphasize confidentiality and compassion. Be mindful of how you're speaking. So using words like survivor or vic versus victim can be uh, more encouraging for someone to talk to you. There's no need to ask personal questions when you're when you're trying to make an a uh, like a snap judgment identification of someone. And I think we should always meet our community members where they're at. So if someone is just like clearly in a bad situation, but doesn't want to talk, it's not our job to push them. Um, these are kind of introductions I like to use in the field. Um, I am an attorney, but these are, in, these are things that I suggest to other people when they're doing outreach, how to talk that like, I'm not an attorney, but I'm trying to educate people in our community or even illustrating through example. Here in the US, it's super common. It's actually super, the reason why we incentivize migration the way we do is to actually exploit and, and trap people in these labor situations. Um, if we had more time, I would actually ask all of you what your introduction would be, but we're kind of running short on time right now. But I promise I will share my slides. Uh, I think this is another way in which we can make people feel more comfortable to come forward. I think lessening the shame or the humiliation or the guilt someone might feel that they were actually at fault for the situation that occurred to them can be really empowering. Um, I like to tell most of my clients that even though their situation is unique and their trauma is unique, unfortunately, this is a very common thing that occurs to many people from their community. And I think just hearing that and normalizing it as this should never have happened to me and I shouldn't carry this like extra burden is actually very helpful in creating rapport about this type of work specifically. Um, and of course, always acknowledge and thank somebody for sharing something really difficult with them, even if it's something that we cannot conceptualize that would be difficult to us. Going back to the example of somebody who, my client who thought she would actually get a curse put on her. Um, that's not something that I would necessarily have a lot of feeling toward because it's not something I would fear. But of course, we can always understand and have empathy towards fears that we may not carry. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts. <laughs> um, if we want, we can go over one more case example, or I'm happy to answer questions. Do you think that you, Aradna, are like a specialist in human trafficking problems and, and the legality of it in, in the sense that, you know, would any of the lawyers that we do have contact with or speak to immigration lawyers also be totally up to speed on the same things you talked about tonight? No, unfortunately not. That's the crazy thing about this work is that even in the Bay Area, I'm one of the few attorneys that I wouldn't say that I'm an expert, although I think I should be a little bit better about um, having confidence in my skills and knowledge at this point. Um, I would say I'm always learning. There's always like a new fact pattern that opens my eyes to the various ways in which force, fraud, and coercion are actually occurring in, what, in the modern era. And I will say in the Bay Area, I am one of like a few attorneys that get most of these referrals because most attorneys themselves don't understand how broad force, fraud, and coercion can be um, as defined by law. And I think as attorneys, we kind of become anxious in terms of sticking to our lane. So because not that many attorneys across the country do trafficking work, this tends to be something that falls on the few practitioners that have kind of created a niche for themselves within it. But one of the goals of our project is to build capacity, to increase the confidence of other attorneys so that they are able to do these inclusive assessments and utilize this tool more proactively. A big thing that I'm trying to do more often than not right now is actually increase screenings in detention centers, because I think there's so many people in detention that are actually just qualified for TV says that we're completely overlooking because we're not asking the right questions. And they're at the end of the line, right? They're like about to get supported. They've probably served 
even longer sentences than they ever should have being in for-profit prisons, um, which is its own trafficking situation in and of itself, but we won't go into that today. Um, I would say you should definitely, the way I like to tell, because uh, obviously I can't absorb every single trafficking or case that occurs or that comes my way. The thing I like to tell clients during a consult is that you need to bring this up to your attorney proactively. You should say that I think I might be qualified for a trafficking visa because these things happen to me and I want you to explore it. I think when I'm in immigration court and I'm doing consults rapidly, it's kind of something I tell people like, when you find a private attorney, make sure you bring up the T visa to them kind of thing. Because then that way the attorney, who, whoever the private attorney is doing the consult will be like, oh yeah, I didn't think about that. Maybe I could do that. Like I'll figure it out kind of thing. But if we're not asking the right questions, our clients aren't going to be answering the things we want them, the things that actually can help them or be probative to them. Um, I'm curious, where can we refer people we think might benefit from a consult? I would say, I thought I have a slide in here about that, but let me see if I do. no, I don't. For immigration, you should refer them to us. Um, but unfortunately, we have not secured funding to continue this project yet. We're hopeful that it comes in soon, but I'm not sure what that means in terms of the whole landscape of how this project is gonna get thwarted. But for now, please reach, please reach out to me and I'm happy to do a consult with anyone you think may benefit from getting a more in-depth assessment. For wage and hour violations, like overtime pay, breaks, deductions, et cetera, et cetera, legal aid at work, is the main nonprofit that I refer clients to because they have free phone consultations. I'll drop that in the chat. Yeah. Um, if you have other referrals, if you want to send it to me, I can send it out to everyone who was signed up for this. Thank you. I, I'll definitely do that. Okay. Thank you, Julie. And for the Dolores Street referrals, do they have to live in San Francisco? <laughs> definitely not. That's like the big win about my grant is that I've been trying to actually do more outreach in Contra Costa and Alameda County and even further because in my humble opinion, I love San Francisco, but it is oversaturated compared to other counties where immigrants actually live <laughs> and are not getting services. Um, no, we, we have no geographic restrictions. We have no criminal restrictions. They could be detained, non-detained, anything. But to keep things um, kind of somewhat focused, we focus almost exclusively on labor trafficking and almost exclusively on people who have had contact with the criminal justice or immigration justice system. So that means they have immigration court or they've had some kind of arrest in the past. Got a quick question. Hey. Uh, not actually a question, but uh, seeking a, your comments and thoughts on a wage and labor violation issue. Okay. Um, new immigrant doesn't have a work visa, uh, asylum seeker. Uh, it is willing to work for um, under the table uh, for a wage less than minimum wage. Mm -hmm. um, hence is why I know what the current minimum wage is because uh, I just looked it up a couple of days uh, ago. Uh, uh -huh. um, kind of what's your thoughts of that situation? And I've seen it before too, right? You get paid cash. Um, and as long, you know, a decent wage, but under minimum wage, most likely, uh, no other violations, assume no other violations. Um, what's your thoughts? I mean, you know, you can tell the person that they could work for minimum wage and that's the law, but, uh, they're asking their employer to not follow parts of the law so that they can get cash, you know, um, so they uh, get, paid under the table. get paid under the table. Yeah. So what's uh, thoughts? I mean, that's a realistic situation. I've seen it many, uh, several times, including last couple of days. So in that situation, I would definitely inform the individual that what the minimum wage is. I would inform them briefly about what other wage and hour protections there are. Like, you know, you shouldn't be working more than 40 hours a week. Um, you should feel safe in your work environment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I would let them know that if they feel violation, they can call legal aid at work. And if it turns into a situation, because we can't dictate to anyone, at the end of the day, the person who is in that situation is the best decision maker for what their economic situation is, what, what their entire situation is, right? What we can do is inform them that they should never feel trapped, 
that they should never feel taken advantage of. And if they do, here are some numbers they can link to, to figure out what things are available to them. That would be my best advice because we often work with people who are being exploited in somewhat of a consensual way. I don't want to say it's fully consensual, but it's basically kind of what you're describing. And I can't say like, don't accept more cash. You know, like I I wouldn't make that decision if I was in that person's shoes. Um, But I can say like, this is the minimum wage. If you continue to not getting paid this, you can bring this up to your employer. If they complain against you, you also have like recourse, you know? And just like letting them know that even though they don't have status, they still have full labor rights in this country that should be obeyed. And they, they have the right to feel comfortable and safe in their work environment. Everyone does, everyone should. That's like the best I can do. I, because it's, I'm not giving legal advice, I'm just giving like what I would do. <laughs> Thank you. (laughs) I hope this was helpful and I hope it somewhat got your gears turning in a broader way of how how broad human trafficking actually is legally, how it's defined legally, and how many cases you may have come across or you may come across in the future that may actually benefit from opening this type of door to somebody. Um, I'm going to drop my email in the chat. For any kind of like questions that may occur about identification, I'm happy to answer that. And I will drop our, Kelly and Julie, I will send our Google refer form, which is how we keep track of our referrals, as well as the phone number that people can call for consult that either one of you can call on behalf of somebody or you can pass off to an actual immigrant who thinks they may have been a victim of trafficking and could benefit from a consult. I'll pass all of that along in email because I'm not on my normal computer right now. So it's a little hard for me to like figure out where all my info is. I apologize. Thank you again so much for your time. It means so much to me that members of the faith community want to learn about this because you are just, you're, you have trust and that's huge for somebody who probably doesn't have any trust in anyone. And so you are the gatekeepers to which we can actually advocate for this client population, and we hope to continue doing so in a more robust way. Thank you. Radna, thank you so much for giving such a clear, defined, informative, inspiring presentation. Thank you so much. That means so much to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I look forward to working with all of you more in the future, either on trafficking cases or just fighting for our immigrant communities in every capacity that we can. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Have a good evening. Thank you. Great work. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Really. You can probably turn off the recording, Kelly. Oh, yeah.